All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Games of Go, episode 10, where we are going to be making our uh, noise function uh, run in parallel so we can use all the cores on our machine. And then when we're done with that, uh, if we have time, we'll turn our, uh, our noise program into a package or a library so that we can use it in uh, other things that we work on in the future. <clears throat> okay, so first a little bit of a talk about uh, how multi-threading works on modern computers. Um, there's a few different ways you can take advantage of multiple cores. Uh, one way is you can run uh, your program as multiple processes. So a process um, is equivalent just to running totally separate programs. So like if you open up uh, Visual Studio Code and then you open up Firefox, those are running as separate separate processes. Those are like the things you see in Task Manager. Each one's a separate process. So you can imagine if you wanted to compute uh, the biggest prime number in the world, you could just run uh, the program two or three times. Uh, those will get run on different cores and <clears throat> each one could just search a different space of numbers. And that works fine. There's a couple downsides, one of which is a process takes some amount of resources. Uh, the OS operating system provides you these, and there's some overhead, some memory it takes for each process and some overhead in managing the process. As well, uh, processes do not share memory. Uh, this process cannot talk to this process's memory uh, directly. They would have to pass messages back and forth somehow. And there's a couple different ways to do that, uh, depending on your operating system. Uh, you can also always talk over the network, which is how a lot of uh, a lot of games work. A lot of games that are multiplayer games, uh, even when you play them single player, there'll be a server running as one process, a client running as another, and they'll talk over the network uh, to to share data. Uh, games like Minecraft and and Quake often often work that way. So that's one. Easy way, if you have a multiplayer game that has to have two processes anyway, you go ahead and get some free uh, parallelism by running separate processes. Uh, but what if you do need to share memory? Because there's some overhead in passing uh, messages back and forth. At the very least, you have to copy data uh, from one place to another. Uh, so what if that's not going to work for you or you want less overhead uh, than a whole process? Uh, then <clears throat> operating systems usually have something called threads as well. So you can have these uh, threads of execution inside a process. You can have many of them. And they can run for different lengths of time and start at different times and end at different times. So these would be threads. And <clears throat> all of the threads are able to access all of the memory in the process. So they can read and write uh, the same memory. Oh, someone in chat is... Uh, Mentioning a problem in a for loop from the last video, we will we will check on that in just a minute. When we get back to the noise code, we'll take a look at it. Thanks for pointing it out. Okay, so uh, threads. We missed an A here. Um, <clears throat> so threads are also something the operating system gives you. You tell the operating system you want to start some more threads and tell it where to start running the code, and it will uh, schedule those as it sees fit. And those things can access the same memory, uh, which can be efficient, but also dangerous. It's easy to make mistakes. Um, but threads also have some overhead. Like it could take uh, on some operating systems like a megabyte per thread. So if you wanted to have three or four threads to do something, uh, that works fine. But what if you wanted to have uh, a thousand threads or 10,000 threads or a million threads? Uh, that would use up a lot of resources. Um, so what a lot of people do is they create um, kind of their own mini threads. And those mini threads can be run across some number of threads. You usually create something like a thread pool. So maybe you create like 10 threads and then you can run thousands of these like mini threads uh, inside some fixed pool of threads. So uh, these kinds of things can be implemented inside the language itself. Like if you're programming in C, you could just make your own or in any language, you could just make your own mini thread system and you have to make your own scheduler to schedule them across uh, operating system threads. Uh, and Go has this kind of idea built in and it's called uh, Go Routines. Go Routines. And there are other languages that have similar things built in like C Sharp has tasks. <clears throat> A lot of C programmers call these green threads and they kind of roll their own or have their own libraries for them. Um, 
So go routines are what we're going to use to parallelize our noise. And uh, I guess we can get started. All right, so first let's take a look at the loop that may have an error. Um, for loop, for i value is equal to, let's see which one we mean. Do you mean this one? Okay, is this, this is just getting the, oh, it's getting a bool. Why was it working? Hmm. I mean, we could do this, because if you don't actually want to use the value, you just want the index, uh, you can do that. No, I think I think this is okay. If you only do one, yeah, okay. I think we're okay there. Yeah, but feel free to to point out mistakes like that because I will make them because this is not entirely uh, canned. Okay. All right, this is our uh, make noise function, which repeatedly calls uh, the noise functions uh, for each pixel that we want to generate. Okay, if you only do one, it returns the value, not the index. Okay, we'll, we'll go in and fix that while we're in here. Chad is, Chad is arguing about the, the function of range. If we, if we have time at the end today, we'll, we'll dig into the documentation of range and we'll, we'll sort it out, okay? <clears throat> okay, so the first thing we wanna do if we're gonna parallelize this is decide uh, how many different Go routines we wanna have running uh, when we generate our noise. So it turns out that generating uh, this noise is what people call an embarrassingly parallel problem. So some problems are really hard to parallelize, uh, but some are very easy. And this one happens to be really easy, which is fortunate for us. So when something is embarrassingly parallel, it means that each uh, step of the algorithm uh, has no dependencies on any previous or upcoming step. So for instance, if we have an array of numbers, say one, two, three, four, five. And we just want to double all of the numbers in the array. All we have to do is divide up the array into two nearly equal sized chunks and have one thread double those numbers, one thread doubles those numbers. And that's no problem. Embarrassingly parallel, no difficulties. Um, whereas if instead you wanted to say, uh, make each number equal to the sum of itself and the previous number, then you have some difficulties because if you just split things up, uh, this thread doesn't know what the previous number is. If it tries to look at it, it might have already been modified by the other thread and you run into all sorts of complications. So fortunately, we don't have that. So this is relatively easy to do with Go routines. Uh, but we need to decide how many, uh, how many Go routines we want. And figuring out the optimum number uh, usually requires some, some testing. Um, but we can also ask uh, we can ask Go um, how many CPUs a machine has. And let's look up real quick what the syntax for that is because I don't remember. Let's see, uh, Golang, number of CPUs. 
I think it's runtime.num CPU. Yep. So <clears throat> num CPU returns an int, which is the number of logical CPUs. And the logical thing is important uh, because if you have a CPU with hyperthreading, like uh, Intel CPUs often do, it may have four physical cores, but each one has hyperthreading, so you have eight logical cores. And currently, Golang uh, will only be able to tell you how many logical cores you have. So <clears throat> we'll say that this equals uh, runtime.numCPU. We'll call this numRoutines. That's how many routines we're going to do. And <clears throat> Uh, I have four physical CPUs with hyperthreading, so this is going to be eight for me, but it could be a different number for you. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Okay, so then we want to break this up into equal sized uh, chunks. So <clears throat> we're going to come up with a batch size that each routine is going to work on. And that'll equal the uh, length of our uh, noise array uh, divided by how many routines we're going to do. Okay, so that's our batch size. And then we're going to do a loop to make a new grow routine. And we're going to make num routines of them. So we're just going to loop over uh, zero to num routines like that. And then to fire off a grow routine, you use the keyword go. And what Go wants is a function, and then it will call that function on a separate uh, Go routine, so on a separate thread of execution. Um, and to do this, we're going to use something called a lambda. And a lambda is a scary sounding thing that's actually very simple. So normally functions have names, right? Named function that does something, right? So you could pass a Go routine a named function. Uh, but if your function is small, in cases like this, it is handy just to put the function uh, directly in line and uh, not give it a name. And that's what a lambda is. It's just a function that has no name. And the syntax for that is just to type func. And you put curly braces, and you can do whatever you want to do inside. So we're going to uh, define a start range for this, which is going to be uh, i times the batch size, and then an end point which is going to be uh, start plus batch size minus one. <clears throat> and then we're going to loop from start to end. And we'll compute our xy from here. So we get the modulus of the uh, width. We would need to know know our width. So let's take in uh, width and height here at the end. And y will equal uh, j minus x divided by the height. So here we're just taking the uh, index in the noise array and uh, sort of backwards computing the uh, x and y values that that index must imply. OK, then we're going to do our noise. So basically, the same thing we did here, but using the j index. And we still need to keep track of our min and max. Again, looking at j this time, not i. And let's kill this. OK. <clears throat> so this is the syntax for a lambda. We've got an anonymous function here. Um, <clears throat> we've broken our thing up into uh, even, even batch sizes. And Calling noise is still keeping track of min and max. So let's give this a try. We need to get a 
width and height now. Let's copy that into all these instances. And don't need that. Okay, let's give this a try, see what happens. Okay, we have an error. Index out of range. And that's happening on line 115. Right here. So, what is happening? So, it turns out that what is happening is <clears throat> this is a, a common pitfall when you work with Go routines. So, when this loop executes, it is going to execute from i equals zero to num routines almost immediately because the main thread is not waiting for these threads to finish, right? We go through the first time through the loop, we start a go routine and that go routine starts running on another thread, but our thread keeps going. And then i equals one and then i equals two. Uh, basically before these threads even get going, i is probably already gonna equal num routines. And num routines is already uh, causing us to get a start value Right, if this is four, four times the batch size is already giving us an illegal start value, and then we're going outside the index of this array. So what we need to do is pass these things a copy of the i variable as it exists when they start, so that they're not looking at the uh, old i, I value. Like these are basically, these were basically uh, pointing to a pointer for this i value. They're all looking at the same i, and i is getting incremented almost immediately. So our go, our anonymous function is now going to take in an i, uh, which is an integer, and we're going to pass that i right here. So that's going to get a copy of the i. So that should fix that problem. All right. Now it runs, but it looks kind of crazy. So what's going on here? So what's happening here is, uh, again, common pitfall, um, we're starting all these go routines and then immediately trying to uh, get our gradient and rescale and draw our noise uh, right away. And so by the time this starts rescaling and drawing, uh, rescaling our noise and setting all the colors uh, and drawing them to the pixel buffer, uh, this hasn't, these haven't all finished yet. So we noticed that like that time we ran it, uh, we got a little bit of noise, a little bit different this time. Right, so the, the way that threads execute is not entirely uh, deterministic. A little bit of noise, but uh, these go routines have just gotten started and our main thread already got down to here and started trying to use uh, this noise array, which hasn't, hasn't finished yet. So we need to do something here to wait until all of these go routines have finished. Now there's a few ways you could do that. You could have like an array of Booleans and each Go routine sets one of the, the booleans and you check, just sort of spin here and wait till they're all true. Uh, you can use channels, uh, which is a feature of Go routines to do this. But there is a built in way to do this, and it is called a wait group. So we're going to make a wait group, call it WG. And then <clears throat> we're going to tell wait group, uh, we need to do this down here. We're going to tell the wait group how many things it's going to wait on by saying wait group dot add num routines. Okay, so we got a new wait group here and we're telling it you need to wait on, on num routines uh, things to, to signal you that they're done. So what we can do here is use the defer function to guarantee that this uh, function when it exits we'll call wg.done. It'll call done on the wait group uh, one time uh, per go routine. So we're gonna start uh, this many go routines and we're gonna wait till that many go routines are done. And to do that waiting, we do that right here. So our main thread is gonna get here pretty quickly after it started all the go routines and it's gonna wait until this wait group isn't signaled uh, enough times. Someone on chat is saying whelp, but I don't know why. Okay. So 
So let's give this a try now. All right, it is working. So something we should probably do is uh, time how fast it is to see uh, how much faster we've actually made it. So let's put in a uh, timer. So let's see. We'll want to maybe start at the start of the function. Uh, start time. I'm done now. Then when we're all done, we will say elapse time. Start time. Get this in seconds and then make it milliseconds. And we'll print line elapsed time. All right, so it took 14 milliseconds. Try it a few times, see if it's relatively consistent. So 13 to 14 milliseconds. What if we uh, force this just to be one thread? All right, so one thread is taking around 60 milliseconds. And when we have or one go routine, and eight go routines is taking around uh, 14 milliseconds. So that's good. We're getting nearly a linear speed up um, by using more threads. OK, so we've definitely made it faster by a lot. That's good. So someone asked to try 100 threads. So let's give that a try. That's a good idea. We'll do a hundred. All right, that is a tiny bit faster, maybe. Uh, it's about the same. We could we could kind of experiment and try to narrow down into some optimum. Ooh, that's slower. That's interesting that a hundred seems to do better than twenty. It's hard to do. Uh, timing of small differences when you're streaming because the stream itself is using up quite a bit of CPU time. See, that one was really slow. So I'm going to stick to, for now, uh, doing numCPU. And sometimes you can figure out that uh, you want some multiple of this, like times two or half or whatever. This is good for now. We're getting a good speed up. OK, so there is a subtle uh, bug here, kind of, which is right here. So <clears throat> the min and max is uh, a variable scoped to this function. And we have multiple Go routines checking and setting the min and max values. So it is possible that a uh, one thread could come in here uh, with a noise value of, say, 10. And it could check to see if uh, 10 is less than the minimum. And it could get in there with, with, with 10. And then while that thread is still there and hasn't set min yet, another thread could come in uh, with 12. And 12 could also be less than min. So 12 could get in here. And then 10 could get set to the minimum. And then immediately after, 12 could get set to the minimum. So our min and max values are not going to be exactly right. Now, for this use case where we're just using it to scale the noise values and we've got like millions of pixels, it's going to be good enough. Um, but there, you know, if you're an artist and picky about this, maybe you want this to be exact or not risk having a uh, min or max being off by, in it, uh, by a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so what's the solution here? Uh, there's a couple options. Uh, one is to use a mutex. And you can use that mutex to lock this section of code. So only one Go routine could be in it at a time. Um, so let's see. How do we use Go routine or Go mutexes? Okay, so we want to make a, a mutex, and once we have a mutex, we can lock and unlock. So let's give that a try. 
Let's see what happens. So we're going to have a mutex here. And before we do this, we're going to lock. And when we're done, all right, this will guarantee that uh, min and max is, is, are checked and updated atomically because only one go routine can get here at a time. So this will make sure our mins and maxes are totally correct. Uh, but let's give it a try. Okay. So that works, but notice that our uh, execution time now is about as slow as it was when we only had uh, one thread going at a time. Okay. So what happens is if you do this naive uh, approach, is you end up ruining all of your parallelism, right? Each each uh, thread is having to wait on the others. They're all getting stuck behind this lock. And there's also some overhead to uh, actually lock and unlock the lock for every single pixel. Uh, so this is no good. So what are some more clever solutions? Uh, there's a couple of approaches. One would be for each Go routine to keep track of its own min and max inside. And then <clears throat> those can report back their min and maxes. Then you can iterate through all of the Go routines min and maxes to find the final min max. That's probably the most common kind of approach one would use. Um, I think though, and I was just trying this out You can do this. Uh, someone is suggesting we try uh, go race uh, simplex noise go to detect race conditions. Uh, we'll try that here in just a second. It's a good idea. Go has a feature that can kind of detect certain kinds of uh, parallelism bugs for you. Okay, so here what we're doing is we're checking if the current value is less than or, or less than the min or greater than the max. And if it is, then we get a lock and then we check again and set. So let's give this a try. All right, so now we're back to our high speed. But this is a tricky thing. Like, are, are all of you totally convinced that this is going to be correct all the time? I think it is, but I am not totally convinced. So this is the kind of problems that come up in multi-threading a lot, is to make things fast and correct uh, can be tricky. You got to think carefully about this to, to see if it's correct. Um, so let's, let's try the go race detector on this, see what happens. Uh, so we need to do uh, go run dash race. So if race detector never terminates, does that mean, does that mean you have a race condition? My CPUs are heating up. <laughs> All right. Ooh, we get warning data race. One twenty three. Yeah, this is interesting. So it, it's telling us that we're reading this this value at the same time potentially that we're writing to it, I believe. But I think it's actually okay because we're gonna recheck it after the lock. So this is, this is interesting. If anyone in uh, chat is more familiar with this, I, I think these can be like, is it possible these can be false positives sometimes? That you're like, your code can be guaranteed correct even though you're getting a warning? I think that's the case. Hmm. 
no false positives. Hmm. So it could be, I mean, it's correct that there is a race condition, but I think the code's always going to get the right answer. So let's leave that as an open question for now. Okay. And if we decide not, we can switch to having each go routine keep track of its own min and max and then get the min and max of those min and maxes after they're all done. Okay, so I'm gonna go dig into this later and figure out for sure what's going on. All right, so we have uh, parallelized this. We've made it a lot faster. Uh, let's now work on turning this into a library, um, which are, or in Go we call them packages. Some other languages uh, call them modules. And the idea here is, you know, we've talked before about how you can build up uh, complex programs by starting with simple functions like this and <clears throat> build up more complex functions using your simple functions. Uh, another level of uh, organization is uh, packages, where you take a whole collection of functions, like all of these functions we have for generating noise, and you take all those uh, functions and group them into a package, and then other code uh, can use that package. So let's let's start the process of doing that. So one thing we want, we want to do is keep, we have some code here that's not relevant to making noise, right? Like all this code to display it, our dependency on SDL2, uh, we're not going to need that, but we might want this code around um, to experiment with. So we're going to leave this simplex noise here because we have our nice UI for playing with noise, uh, but we're going to make a new folder. Let's call it uh, just noise. and a new file, noise.go. And we'll copy all this stuff in here, and we'll start ripping out the things that we don't need. So let's uh, now call this package noise. So whenever you just have a, a, a code file that you're just gonna run, just be an executable, executable you call it main. Uh, but now we're actually gonna make a package that other code can use. So you've gotta pick a name, other than main. So we're going to call it noise. And then <clears throat> we're going to start yanking out lots of stuff that's not relevant. Um, and we're going to yank out all this gradient stuff because all this gradient stuff assumes that we know what kind of color representation uh, someone's going to use. And people are going to have different sorts of uh, color formats. So we're just going to yank all this out. We're not going to need clamp. I'm not going to do this rescaling. So all that can go. We're not going to have a notion of window height and window width. We are still going to have our turbulence and FBM. We don't need our sample name function. Okay, this is going to stay around. Um, but we're not going to take in pixels anymore because we're not going to just draw to the screen. What we're going to do instead is return a noise array. Okay, so we're still going to do this. This will be W times H, not the window width and height. Not print that out every time. <clears throat> and don't need to keep track of the elapsed time anymore. And we're not going to do the getting the gradient. We're just going to return the noise. Okay, no colors, no set pixel. All the stuff in our main function can go away. But we definitely need to keep all of this because that's our basic simplex noise. Okay. <clears throat> So we've ripped out all the stuff we don't need to be part of the package. And we notice uh, when you hit save, the, uh, the Go tools change our import setup. So they, now we no longer have a dependency on, dependency on SDL. Uh, so <clears throat> anyone can use this uh, noise library, not just people using SDL. Okay, so now onto a new feature I haven't mentioned before, uh, which is the concept of uh, exported functions versus non-exported functions or, or variables. So in Go, if you start a function with a lowercase letter, it is not exported, which means 
uh, if you are using this code from another package, you can't see or use any of the functions or variables that start with a lowercase letter. So right now, everything is lowercase, which means this would be a completely useless package. So the thing we're going to want to expose for sure is make noise. Okay, make noise is going to like make a uh, certain size two-dimensional uh, block of noise based on the parameters you give it. So that needs to be exported for sure. And then uh, the convention in Go is if something is exported, you have to comment it. Okay. And, and comments for functions are supposed to start with the name of the function. So you want to describe what it does. And it's possible we might also want to uh, expose this function. That's kind of up to you. And if we do that, we'll have to call it with the capital here, here. And it's possible you might also want to expose uh, turbulence and FPM. This would be if someone wanted to just get a single pixel of noise at a time, which they might. So you could expose that. OK, the other thing our library needs is right now uh, we have two kinds of noise we can do. We can do turbulence or, or FB, fractal Brownian motion. Uh, make the ways we just have that hard coded. So we need to have some way to pass in uh, what kind of noise we want. So let's do uh, an, an enum. So we'll do uh, type, let's see. The enum syntax is always bizarre. So I'm going to borrow. So we'll do type, noise type. We'll do FBM and turbulence. Let's see. I'm going to leave it like that. OK, turbulence. OK, so this now needs to take in the uh, noise type. What we want to do here is say if noise type equals turbulence, then turbulence. Else if FPM. Okay, and then uh, some people might notice that we've put a branch in an inner loop here, and you might be worried that branches are can be expensive. Uh, but the good thing here is that this branch, whenever you generate noise, it's always going to go through the same branch uh, every single time through the loop. So branch prediction is going to work perfectly. So this actually will be a very small uh, performance penalty. Uh, the alternative would be something like making two separate make noise functions with lots of repeated code, with the only difference being this. But this, this works fine. OK, I think, I think we're done. What we can do now is say go build to build our package. And <clears throat> if uh, it's important here that you have your uh, project set up in your go path directory. If you didn't, if you didn't set your go path environment variable, uh, it needs to be in the default go path directory, which is whatever your operating systems user directory is. 
and so on, just like we did in the in the setup day. So if you did that, you're good. If you decided to just dump it in C colon slash, this won't work. Because when we try to use this package, it's going to look in the, the go path uh, for, for the package name. <clears throat> All right, so let's try, uh, let's try and use this. Someone is saying there's a problem with the games with Go website. With the link. I don't know. I don't have that problem with the link. Interesting. Okay. Let's try to use our new noise library in Pong. So if you didn't do the Pong episode, you can... Just start your own basic uh, basic project if you want. So what we're going to do is try to use the noise library in Pong. Uh, so what we can do, we're going to want to get our noise array just once. So we need to import. So this will be uh, different depending on what your uh, path layout is. So for me, it's github.com slash jackmot slash noise. And that should let us call So you see here, uh, the IntelliSense features can see into the package, and it also reports what our uh, comments were. All right, so that's one of the ways that packages make code easy for other people to use or for you to reuse later, is only the things that you care about using are exposed, and you get your, your comments on top of them. So you don't even have to look at the source code, hopefully, to make good use of them. So let's see, frequency five, two, three, width, and height. Let's see how that does. Let's see. No, it's declared and not used. That's fine. We're going to use it. So now we're going to want to take our rescaling stuff. In our gradients, all this stuff that we used. We're going to add all this to our Pong program. And we got multiple LERPs. Let's call this floating point LERP. We need to change that to be floating point lerp. Okay. Oh, and this reminds me, there was a, a bug here. If you followed along in the Pong episode, we were dividing here. That should be multiply to turn this into milliseconds. So if you haven't made that correction, do that now. Okay, so we now have to we now have a noise array of floats that we need to turn into uh, colors uh, that we can draw on the screen. So let's get a gradient first. Uh, <clears throat> so here you can decide what you want your Pong to look like. You can make uh, happy little clouds or we can do uh, maybe like, like devil Pong or something. We'll do fiery Pong. Uh, let's do like red. We'll do hell pong. Go from red to black. So 
So we pass the noise. Oh, we've forgotten something important. We need to know the min and max in order to rescale our noise. So let's do multiple return values. Remember, that is a, a feature of Go. You can return more than one thing from a function. So we're going to do min and max, which are ints. And then down here, we need to return noise, min, and max. And then because we declared uh, noise, min, and max in our return, we don't need to do is equal to. So we get rid of that. Oh, these are these are floats. All right, float thirty-two. All right, cool. Now we go back to Pong. We can get noise min and max like that. And then we can pass that to the rescale, pass the gradient, and then pass the pixels. And I think what we can actually do is take this rescale and draw and actually repla replace the clear function. So we're not going to need to clear anymore if we're drawing a full background of noise. So let's give it a try. Oh, let's, let's build. Since we made a change to the noise, we need to go build it again. Then we can go to Pong. Okay, we've only got red. I think our, our settings are no good. Let's see. Is it just bad? Oh, still just red. Oh, we need to be building in here, not in simplex noise. Okay, still just red. So let's see if we can figure out the problem. Um, Go into here. Let's see. Let's see what our noise values actually are. So, just to make sure they're coming through. All right, we're getting all kinds of different noise values. If anyone in chat thinks they know what's up, feel free to chime in. Let's we'll see what our gradient's looking like. Someone asks if the noise should be between 0 and 225. And yes, that's exactly what this, this function does. It's got the min and max values of the noise, and it rescales it to be between 0 and 255. Okay, so our gradient is good. Yeah, I was I was printing out the noise values before the rescaling process. So if we if we look at it here, oh, I know it's wrong. 
we are repeatedly, uh, repeatedly rescaling it. Okay, so here's what we need to do. This should just return. Let's go ahead and do this the right way. So this will return new pixels. Okay, we're gonna make a new float array and this needs a width and height. Times four. So we have four color components per pixel. And this is result, result, result. We're ignoring alpha for now. And then return the result. Uh, oh, this is a byte, byte array. Okay, so we will call rescale and draw just one time. Right here. We'll give it the window width and window height. We'll call this the noise pixels. And then instead of our clear in the game loop, we will noise pixels We just copy our noise pixels into the actual uh, screen buffer each time. All right, there we go. Now we have Devil Pong. All right. And we're about <coughs> near the end, so that was good timing. Any uh, questions or concerns about today's stream? By the way, uh, uh, Tension Twitch uh, Tension Twitch asks if subs uh, get access to the source code. Um, currently, I don't have it set up that way, but I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, if you can uh, whisper me or something, let me know your GitHub. If you have a GitHub username, let me know. And uh, yeah, we can give subs access to the source code. That seems more than fair. So anyone else who's subbed, uh, whisper me your GitHub username, and I'll, I'll grant you access. Uh, also, if you're, a, if you're an Amazon Prime member, you can use your Amazon Prime uh, you can connect it to Twitch, and you can use that to get uh, one free sub uh, per month to, to whichever channels you want. So that's an easy way to sub for free. And you also don't get the ads if you're a sub. And uh, Tanshin, I, th I think this is your first time on the, on the stream. Uh, the reason we do the rescaling process every time uh, is that depending on what parameters you pass to things like uh, fractal Brownian motion, the range of noise values you get can be different. Uh, it won't always be zero to one or negative one to zero. It could be anything. Um, so the, the, the way to make it sort of easy to use is just do a second pass to, to rescale it. Um, if, you're, if you're aiming for like a super high performance and don't want to do that, um, you need to like know ahead of time what parameters you're going to use and figure out by experiment what scaling factor to use. And then you can just add that right here so you don't have to make that second pass. And just some other notes on making uh, noise generation really fast. Uh, there's a couple more things one can do. Uh, this algorithm can actually be implemented using SIMD instructions. So SIMD instructions are things that can do uh, additions and multiplies and shifts and so on on multiple values at a time. 
So if you have like SSE2 instructions on your CPU, you could do four floating point values at a time. If you have AVX2, you could do eight floating point values at a time. Uh, if you have AVX512, you can do 16 at a time. Uh, the trick is you have to write uh, different versions of the function for all of the different SIMD instruction sets out there. It's very hard to do in Go. You have to use Go Assembler. There's not a good way to write it out in normal Go code. Uh, usually easiest to do in C with intrinsics. Uh, so you can get like five to seven times faster uh, by making SIMD versions of noise. And then the way to make it the fastest is uh, send it to a GPU. You can write a compute shader uh, to do this. And that ends up being like thousands of times faster. So that's, that's what a lot of uh, modern games do today is uh, ship it off to the GPU uh, if they're going to be generating noise uh, constantly. Uh, but you can you can do it very fast on the CPU uh, as well. So there's still lots of room for improvement if people want to uh, play around with that. All right, any questions before we go? I'll hang around for a couple more minutes just in case anyone has uh, comments or thoughts. I do want to go back. I'm going to do some more research on the race condition thing. And think about whether this could ever actually be incorrect or cause a problem. So I will I will report back with my findings, and if anyone wants to give their thoughts, feel free to comment on the video too. All right, so next uh, episode this Thursday, uh, we're going to do uh, learn how to load images from files, and we're going to kind of create our own texture system where we can load uh, load images from files, make a texture out of them, be able to draw that texture anywhere on the screen. And we're also going to do alpha blending, which means if we load a texture which has transparency information inside of it, uh, we can draw those textures on top of each other and, and see through them. And we're going to do alpha blending uh, by hand at first to see how it works. And uh, if there's time, we'll also do uh, scaling of the textures by hand so they can get bigger or smaller. And uh, we'll play with bilinear filtering, which is a way to make scaling uh, look good. So we're going to do all that stuff by hand, so we'll know exactly how it works, uh, which sets you up really well if you decide to use game engines or OpenGL in the future, because you'll know exactly what it's talking about when you're using some of the built-in functions to do those things, and you'll know how it works. All right, that is it for tonight. I'll see everyone in a couple days. Thanks for tuning in.